Welcome to Cut the Bull, an insightful podcast which addresses the news of the day and the cultural issues plaguing our society, bringing logic and context to these topics and discussing solutions too real for mainstream pundits. Now, here are your hosts, Charles Love and Wilfred Riley. Hello and welcome to Cut the Bull. I am Charles Love alongside my co-host, Wilfred Riley. Our guest co-host, Christy Kelly, is back. And I guess this week is David Cipher. He is a former candidate in New Jersey for Assemblyman, Republican, and a frequent op-ed writer for several uh, publications, including The American Thinker. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Finally. Finally. <laughs> finally. It takes a while. We have a backlog. David's been coming on since uh, 83, I think. But he's finally here. And we're going to start. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about several things. But I think we're going to start off with uh, one of your recent pieces. You talked about criticism of Black conservatism. And what was interesting about it is you, I'll let you describe the take. But it seems like you were, um, as a Republican, you get beat up a lot as being dismissive of the issues in the black community mm -hmm. or you know only caring about one thing you seem to be pretty even killed in the sense which is rare so you should probably stay off twitter in that case but <laughs> in the sense that you were saying it's okay to critique people it's okay to not like them or not like their personality but you should not necessarily dismiss them you know outright and everything that they say because they might be right so talk about why you wrote that piece and what was the point you were trying to make yeah, I mean, I I was um scrolling through social media and I seen an article by the Root, and it was very it was a funny article. It was called the lit the worst list of black conservatives, and it went down the line basically. You know, had a firing squad on all the famous uh, black conservatives, and mm -hmm. you know, we're not a monolithic, but you, you know, my whole thing was you know there needs to be an exchange of ideas, and you may not like the messenger, but analyze what the message is mm -hmm. now. Are there people that could deliver the message better? Sure. But the actual data and the actual message, does it make sense? And it is something that can help the black community. Then it's something worth listening to. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, Will, the first thing I want to say about that, I mean, I don't pay attention to the root. We all know the root. I mean, they're funny sometimes, but I've been ignoring them for years. But I, I had to read David's article. And so I clicked on the list. And they're lazy, Will. Herman Cain was on it. Can we get... <laughs> living living conservatives on the yeah i'm looking at it right now and a lot of these people it seems like they just had someone google black republicans like tim scott who wrote one of the best anti-policing bills of all time just a moderate guy he's a senator is on the list herschel walker i mean you know i, yeah. I can see that one you know i'm i'm curious about whether i'm gonna make this list okay so i've got <laughs> Close. all these damn ads are popping up okay okay so yeah. anyway but so like a couple just as a, a few serious comments on that i mean one the root is astonishingly racist and i think this illustrates one of the double standards in our society like i mean the root every year has i think it's the becky awards mm -hmm. where the winner of america's biggest becky like the most like awkward but sexual white woman is actually sent a jar of mayonnaise by the root and it's difficult to imagine any, it's funny, yeah, like they've got a good sense of humor, but it's difficult to imagine in like the post Blazing Saddles world, anything like that from the right, like the Shaniqua Awards, where like the most hood behavior of the year was rewarded with like four guys in cowboy outfits going to your house and like giving you a bucket of chicken. Like that would be considered totally unacceptable off the line. But aside from uh, double standard stuff there, I mean, there are some real points, which I think David, the guest, uh, kind of brought up. One is the idea of, is there some grifting on the black right? And I mean, I think the honest answer there is, yeah, just in the sense that if your focus is bringing up problems in the black community to an almost mm -hmm. entirely white right wing audience, that's not actually going to do a lot to resolve problems in the black community. I think all of us do a fair amount of actual community outreach. I teach at a black college. So that is there. But then at the, the third level beyond that, the question is, is the engagement from people like this ever good faith? And that gets into the basic point of, I don't want to get long winded here. All the problems are real. So like, what's the, what's the root doing about them? And right. why are they calling out a lot of these random brothers that are actually doing pretty positive things? Like the Tim Scott being on the list is ridiculous. I see Clarence Thomas. So it gets back to that point of you can have a good faith objection 
but most people who are criticizing the black right or the right in general don't. That I think that's where this stands right now. And uh, yeah. Christy, uh, let's go to Christy, who's coming to us from the call center in India. Um, <laughs> um, Christy, what are your thoughts uh, on the criticism of uh, the, the, the hit list of the bad black conservatives or the criticism of black conservatism as a whole? Yeah, I mean, no, I'm looking at the list and I see people ben like Carson. Kanye. Yeah, Ben Carson. I thought Sage they loved Kanye. Still, Sage Still, uh, mm -hmm. David Cameron. So there doesn't seem to be a like a, a theme. It right. just seems like you said, it seems to just be throwing it on the wall of any popular, right. you know, black mm -hmm. conservative. It's not like it's just political. They got, you know, actors, political Pundits, right. they got us all kind of, you know, mixed together. The mayor so. of Dallas? I, I don't all mean to interrupt <laughs> you, Chris, but like these just seem like a bunch of black people that are doing pretty Mayor Dallas, he left the party, so that right. makes him bad. He's been a Republican for three hours. How was he the how did he make the list? Wow. But right. Harris Faulkner is on the list. Right, is right, it, right. You know, by right. her just being on Fox, it makes her, you know, it kind of seems to go with the theme as if you're a Black conservative, if you're a Black Republican, automatically you should make this list. And, and the fact that none of us are on this list means that we haven't made it yet. I might be up today, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah. Tim Scott. <laughs> okay. Will's like that's so crazy. Uh, David, what, were you, what, what did you want to say? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, circle back to the Harris Faulkner piece because I feel like that's important in my article. They criticized her based on the basis of her talking about two things, black on black crime and BLM. And my argument is basically this. You don't have to like Harris Faulkner. You don't. I can't tell you who to like. But what is she saying is true? Mm -hmm. If you look at black on black crime and you look at killings by cops on black people you will you will literally have black people that say yeah they 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 they, they hunting us down mm -hmm. and you just ask a black person how many people how many black people do you think the cops kill? Oh, they're giving them it's, it's got to be hundreds people actually believe that it's got to be hundreds when it's really like I, the last time i looked it was probably 20 and then for the 2020 um the last time i looked at the statistics the fbi bureau it was 200 122 shot, not killed. But if you look at the murders from black on black crime, it has to be quadruple that. So I say in my article, I'm not telling you not to put bad cops in jail. I'm not telling you not to reprimand bad cops, but we need priorities. What is the main priority? The data tells you what the main priority is. The main priority is the bad actors in the community. I'm not saying everybody's a bad actor, but that 1% with the anti-social behavior that's kind of making it a toxic environment for everybody, that needs to be the focus instead of the main focus, the the the, the media energy being focused on the the highlight reels of, unfortunately, a uh, 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 George Floyd. Well, go ahead. Tell him the numbers are even worse than he thought. How yeah, many I mean, would the average man say were shot and killed? Yeah, so like when you look at these numbers, I mean, this is this is absolutely insane. So first of all, the number of unarmed black men shot and killed by the police last year was 12. I think there may have been two, two unarmed black women as well, something like that. I mean, men commit like 90% of serious crime. Mm -hmm. uh, when you compare that to the number of murders, I mean, after the, so the black murder rate has doubled during the Black Lives Matter era, by the way. We'd gotten right. down and we were still pretty significant, but reasonably close to the national, if not the white average, that that's all changed. So the black murder rate during the BLM era 2012 to today went from like 14 to 16 per 100,000 per year to 33 per 100,000 per year, which is the Jamaica levels. Right. I mean, so that's that's a pretty significant change there. Last year, I think there were 21,000 murders, 58 percent black. We're 13% of the country. So when you actually compare these numbers, I mean, you've got literally 12 guys over here. And then over here, you've got 50 plus percent of 20,000. And that's not to deny there's a high crime rate in poor white or Latino communities. But I think they acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Like there was no yeah. decline in policing in those those areas like where I live in Appalachia during Black Lives Matter. It was kind of just us that were doing this, that were marching for kind of dead junkies or rapists that tried to stab a cop. I mean, Jacob Blake and so on down the line, <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. Yeah. Right. But I mean, the, I guess the final line here, though, like when you talk about what people think happened, they did a famous poll, Skeptic Research Center, which is what I think Charles is referring to. Mm -hmm. 
where they asked black people and urban white guys as well, how many how many unarmed individuals do you think are murdered by the police every year? And I forget offhand whether it was 10,000 black people or just 10,000 innocent people. But the, the average answer from liberals was in the, the multiple thousands, like 10,000 people was one of the most common responses are shot while unarmed by the police. I mean, in reality, you're looking at black people, the figures 12. If you're looking at everyone, I mean, the figures well under 100. So that it's just two orders of magnitude above anything that's happening. And that has to affect how you believe. Right. Uh, how you live. Like, if you think the cops are as likely to kill you as everyone combined is to kill you, there has to be an element of terror every time there's a traffic stop, so on. But it's all just bullshit. That's the problem. And why wouldn't it be if you believe that? But Christy, uh, they, they touched on, the, he, he mentioned Harris Faulkner, and they touched on the, he mentioned two issues. They touched on the policing part. Mm -hmm. But the other one was BLM. And, and Will earlier said there's yeah. some drifting, drifting going on on the right, but man, was I calling that out early on. I was telling people <laughs> You're talking increased crime, <laughs> mansions, no support of anything. I, I think, I mean, they changed the site so so much. But when I was writing my book, Race Crazy, go pick it up. And I and, I, and there's a whole section on BLM. And I talk about at the time of writing, you go on the site. This, this was the craziest thing for me. We can get into, you know, I try to point out the things that people aren't noticing. You can get into the, and it matters, crime increasing. You can get into, you know, whether people are making money. And they bought mansions. No, no. This organization, assuming positive intent, just for a moment, Will, started because police were indiscriminately shooting blacks and they wanted to fix that and address it. This is going to shock you, Christy, because you, you haven't read my book. You should buy four or five copies. Yeah. But at the time I wrote the book, I'm going to give yeah. you a guess. Okay, try try. I know you're all the way in India, but try to figure it out. What is the one thing that was not on the BLM website? One thing not something on they the... did not talk about on their website. Hmm. The family. Oh, nice guess. Police shootings. Yeah. They didn't talk about police <laughs> on the BLM website. The organization <laughs> founded to end crimes of the state against blacks by police, and they didn't tell me. You know what they talked about? They talked about. I always get the wrong one. I always say ASAP Rocky, but it wasn't him. Who was the rapper that was that we didn't know until he got caught up? But he was born in London, and they were twenty one. What was his 21 name? Savage, yeah. yeah, twenty one Savage. At the yeah. time, they were trying to deport them, so they had a whole section on the website. <laughs> it's <laughs> hilarious. I'm sure it's gone. I, I got a screenshot, but there's a whole section on the website about how they fought to keep him in the country. I mean, they had a they had a gala to raise money with Mike Tyson at it in L.A. This is what they were bragging about. They're like, look at wow. how much we've done. What do you do for the black community? We got 21 Savage to stay in the country. What do you mean? We <laughs> that was the issue. It's like, you're talking about a grip. They didn't even mention police brutality on this website of the organization founded on police. You talk about a massive grip, and they were getting hundreds of millions of dollars because of this. Corporations were bowing at the feet. And they and did nothing about it. So if they want to attack the black on black crime, because I don't really use that phrase, right? I just say crime is bad. If it's in my community, I want it gone. If it's violent, I want the person in jail. If it's not violent, we can work something out. I don't care what they look like. I don't care who they are, right? If they happen to all be black, it is what it is. But but the BLM thing, man, it, they wreak havoc in every corner of the country, education, crime, everywhere. And they were, you know, rewarded handsomely for it. Mm. So... So BLM, I always say, well, first of all, I'm the baby conservative here, right? So I had my transformation right at that time. But my husband has always been conservative and he's really, he's not political, but he's really good at seeing stuff. So immediately he was like, uh-uh, BLM, it's a hoax, don't fall for them. And I'm looking at him like, well, of course it's good, you know? So I credit him for me not going down that rabbit hole of believing into them. And so he was like, look at what they stand for. They stand up, stand for basically the destruction of the nuclear family. How did gay, you know, transgender, bisexual, all that get, you know, lumped in with the BLM movement. He was the one to kind of point that out to me, because if you're not looking for it, then you will be deceived and you won't kind of dig into um, the motive behind the group. So but if you look at BLM, I think when you're talking about uh, groups like that, you do have to distinguish Black Lives Matter, the thought, the sentiment versus the organization, unless you will offend people. And at this point, I think that they have been so discredited 
that I don't see how people even still have it in their bio. Like, how are you still defending them at all at this point? This is like this maybe I didn't even think about. It. I was gonna say something when you said in the bio it made me laugh. I had a really pleasant back and forth because she was nice, but <laughs> shocked who I got into it with about that. Martina Navratilova. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yes, because we had an exchange wow. about the, the gender thing, because you know she's a lesbian, but she's against the trans stuff. We we're talking about something, and then she said something, and and I replied, and I said. And she replied about something I said. I said, well, that's not really what I'm saying. I agree with you, except for this. And speaking of which, why you got that BLM in your, in your bio? She said, because I think Black Lives Matter. But so do you still support the organization? She's like, yes. I'm like, hello? Are you kidding me? How do you <laughs> think that's helping the community? I went on this thing. And she, she, she just kind of did. We didn't get into it. She didn't say anything after that. But you'd be surprised, Christy, how many people still do. But what we disagree is, I never did. Maybe I was wrong at the beginning, but I have no now after the fact with the hindsight, no problem with saying I refuse to separate the two. I'll be damned if I say, well, I'm OK with the slogan, but not the organization. The, the slogan came from the organization. So if the root is bad, all of it's bad. Nope, no, no, no. I want no part of it. <laughs> I, I think the issue is that nobody ever denied that black that they lives matter. matter. Right. So like when, when right. people say something like black lives matter, or all lives matter, the only reason blue lives matter, the only reason any of that's controversial is that it ties into like the street fighting three years ago. Right. So, I mean, like I wouldn't say black lives matter very often because I think that that would immediately invoke all the stuff that surrounded that. And like right. one thing Christy pointed out is that black, BLM, the organization was basically a gay rights group. Like, not a lot of people know this, but uh, myself and another writer looked at this for Spike, like Funny UK magazine. Mm -hmm. And Black Lives Matter, what is it? BLMGNF, like Black Lives Matter oh, yeah, Global, the, the Global Network Global, Foundation. Yeah, the global organization. yeah, their actual uh, 501c3, which was like a $100 million group. They gave over the years, like multiple hundreds of millions of dollars to different people. It was, it was at least 100 mil. And... None of them were like black street level organizations, like preachers, former gang members, just people in the community, fathers, coaches, blah, blah, blah. But like they were all things like the transgender district. Like they were these extreme edgy gay rights groups. Like you can still look up the articles, just like my last name and spiked. But there were like 50 groups that got money from Black Lives Matter. This isn't an exaggeration. And the list of them was hilarious. Like one of them was for the Guarrels. Like, it's a group that pays for, like, sex workers and trans people to, like, go shopping. Like, they travel and they can have a relaxed experience because their lives are hard. You know, it's just all that type of stuff. And if you look into the background of Patrice Calores, her girlfriend was one of the staffers for the group. Like, all those people were gay rights activists. Mm -hmm. Like, Patrice Calores is now a naked artist. She lives in, I think, the Tenderloin in San Francisco, among other places. She's got five houses. But it's just like she's doing these modern art shows. Right. Um, and that was always the background. It was never like we are going to go to the hood or to rural areas and help black people. We're not going to work with police departments and teach hand to hand right. self-defense or something like that. The the pitch was very different from the reality of where the money went is a very simple way to right. put that. Well, the last thing I right. want to say about this hor horrible organization and the horrible people behind it is that earlier I said that the site said nothing about policing, which is what it was for. But and, and Will made a great point about the strong gay and transgender push about the organization. But there was something else. And, you, and, and Christy mentioned that uh, they took the fam nuclear family thing up. But there was something else. It's timely with what's going on in, in, in the geopolitical politics today. There was something else that was on their site. Maybe it is a tie. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to connect it to the police brutality and shooting uh, innocent, unarmed black men. But it was BDS. The early site talked about boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. Wow. I don't know what your views are on that. I don't really care. Wow. I think it's a weird thing to have on the site of the of the organization that's taking funds to end, you know, police brutality. Just seemed odd. But David, what would you like to add? Yeah, um, just two quick things. Uh, number one, um, with the whole BLM thing, and I think uh, Will touched on it. What I found funny about the organization, because if if you sit there and you list, listen to like a social justice warrior or an average black liberal, they'll tell you, hey, man, you see this poverty going on in the black community. We need a, 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 a head start programs. We need this. And we need that. And as much money as they had, they could have single handedly funded all of those projects in all of the big black uh, uh, city-owned states like Chicago, 
uh, what's it, Atlanta, all of those cities, they actually had the money. But like you said, they diverted it to Democratic Party, Joe Biden, all these other causes. So in my mind, I thought it weird because if you have the money to make change, why give it to the Democrats and hope any political party, it? any political party? That'd be crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You got that you, amount of money. Mm -hmm. Right. I, you have the catalyst for change. Why give it to him in hopes that maybe he'll pass some reparations, but which he still never did. <laughs> I, well, well, so, I want to switch gears. I said that was the last thing, but since you said that, one other thing that I, I write about in the book is that there was a period of time when you went to donate to them because they weren't a 501c3 yet. They, they were a sponsored charity, which is totally fine. A lot of charities do it. Mine did it before we got our 501c3. But if you click on it and it takes you to the site and it took you to Act Blue, right? So uh -huh. It was like, you know, it's it's a bundling organization for the Democrats, but not tied directly to the Democrat Party. So you can't say it's Democrat, but we know who's funding them. And not to mention they had, you know, uh, convicted terrorists on their board for a while. But anyway, a uh, thousand currents, look it up. But 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 David, you do what makes you different from a lot of what the stereotypical argument about conservatives, particularly black conservatives are, is that you don't hold back your criticism of black conservatives and how they mention it. So your article, that the one we were addressing earlier, was talking about how just because you don't like a personality, if the, what they're saying is factual, you know, one, they should be allowed to say it. And if it's factual, you should consider it and you should deal with that problem. But I know you talked about Larry Elder. You and I talked once and you talked about Larry Elder, uh, who I, I guess whom you agree with on some some cases. But in this particular instance, not the Breakfast Club, but the other uh, podcast he was on. Higher Learning. Yeah, you took, notes on, you, you, you took issue with him on how he responded. It was the podcast, if you all remember, where they challenged him. I said, you keep talking about the Black family. What have you done to help? And you didn't have you had an issue with his uh, answer. So talk about that, you know, as it relates to how Black conservatives push out their message. Yeah. So, as you know, Larry Elder went on the Breakfast Club and, you know, these guys probably don't have much political knowledge. So he skated fairly easy so then he goes on higher learning with the guy who used to be on tmz i think his name is uh i forgot van or the one who, who yeah. confronted kanye crying right right so obviously him with the girl rachel they're both hbcu graduates so obviously they have a little more knowledge so they pressed him and i found it weird that this is your flagship issue right a uh, uh, two-parent home fatherless home they ask you, oh, what are you doing about it? In the back of my mind, I'm sitting there and, and he kind of like skirts around the question. I don't know if he didn't want to like get caught up in the gotcha moment, which he ended up getting caught in the gotcha moment. My thing is, if you're Larry Elder, that's your talent. You're lending your voice to millions of people. Millions of people are listening to what you're saying. So if they're saying, hey, what are you doing about it? I'm utilizing my talent. I'm bringing awareness to the issue and I'm talking about what I think should be done to help the community. Now, it doesn't mean that if he if he doesn't if he's not involved in a a, a nonprofit like say Obama, that means that he has no claim in the subject. That's not true. That's his talent. Everybody has a talent. Some people will contribute to nonprofit. Some people will be the spokesman. So everybody has a talent. So I just feel like he kind of did himself a a, a disservice and back himself into a, a corner based on an issue that is his flagship issue, which mm -hmm. which I feel is a valid point. And um, just real quick before you go, I talk about that in my article. I say, listen, you don't have to like Larry Elder. And to be honest with you, if they did a speech right now and they said, hey, who do you want, Larry Elder or Bob Woodson with the Woodson Foundation? I would pick Bob Woodson because I know he knows his stuff. I would pick Bob Woodson. But regardless of that fact, if he says, hey, the data says that two parent homes is the best vehicle to raise a kid and they have the statistics laid out, they have this, that and the third, you're fighting against something that's really laid out. Now you're fighting against the messenger, but the message is true. The message is true. Right. So uh, anything to add to that, either of you? I kind of had I guess I kind of had a different reaction to that mm -hmm. because the way I was raised, and this is going to be kind of, you know, whatever. You respect your elders, no pun intended, right? The name and of I, <laughs> I <laughs> felt that they were very 
not only disrespectful with him being an older man, but I also thought they were very unprofessional towards him. So a guest, so, yes, they told him to get the F out of here. I would never tell my guest that. Maybe he just <laughs> maybe got David. Nobody knows. <laughs> maybe he just got thrown off of his game because of the level of disrespect from these young people. I don't I know. Mean, Tesla Tesla was pretty bad. He he kept his cool. But but she still like was like, sir. Um, Remember, she's sir, sir. She still had a certain level of deference. Mm -hmm. Like, I think this younger, you know, and, and I'm dating myself, but this <laughs> this younger generation, like, not only is there no professionalism, but there's zero respect. Even if you don't agree with Larry Elder, mm -hmm. I know our grandmothers taught us to respect our elders. My As old as I am, if I got on here and I was disrespectful to somebody that was my senior, my phone would be ringing for my mama. <laughs> It's like, where is that level of disrespect now from these people that are doing journalism or right. social commentary? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, there are a couple different levels to that. I mean, so first of all, I think that a lot of people on the political left really believe that everyone who disagrees with them is evil. Like, I mean, when, every time I go online and I talk about some controversial topic like Palestine, I mean, there are a ton of people. I usually just block them unless I feel like they're going to be an earner for me and really, you know, bring in that cash with like 50 comments a day. But I mean, if if I usually just get rid of them, but there are a lot of people that are like, you're a Nazi. I hate you. You're evil. You have no human soul. I think people really believe and internalize this. So I think if you're a young upper middle class black person, you went to one of the great HBCUs and you majored in one of the more woke fields like sociology and you're you're talking to Larry Elder, you probably do really think that this guy is like a Ku Klux Klansman, that he's caping <laughs> for white supremacy. Like you're probably barely able to control your hatred and contempt. And of course, that's all bullshit. Like even when I, I, I did a debate once with an actual white supremacist, Jared Taylor, mm -hmm. and I'm like kind of jokingly saying amoral businessman. Like I don't really care what people think. I mean, I've been in foreign countries where people hate Americans. But I was talking to him before the show and I asked him, you know, how can you defend these ideas? And what he said was, well, like, I don't really hate you. Like, I'm not riding around in a, you know, robe. I basically just think what most Americans did in 1960. Like, I'm mildly personally racist. I think you have the right to associate with whatever, whoever you want. He's just honest about it. And I think that that realization that even someone who actually is a bigot is nothing like what you might think from watching mainstream media. And most people are not bigots at all was a pretty significant one. But I don't I don't think these people have had that yet. So they they thought they were in the presence of evil in terms of how Elder responded. I think that they're I think his perspective probably like I mean, I, I talk with Larry Elder sometimes on Twitter, although not much. I think his perspective was probably like in technical terms, I won the debate. Like they were just shouting at me, what have you done? And he was kind of responding, like, do you guys have a good faith question? Right. And he was is, saying, is this... so you admit that there's a problem because you keep saying, what have I done about yeah. the problem? So no, you admit I mean, he... there's a problem, right? Yeah. Like he was, he was arguing in a very technical lawyer like fashion, like, okay, so will you guys come from a place of good faith and admit there's a problem? And then will you stop attacking me so I can discuss the problem? And I mean, Elder kind of won that exchange in a courtroom sense. The problem is that most people watching that don't spend a lot of time in courtrooms unless they're the defendant, you know, like to them, it's just like, oh, <laughs> wow. they shut down that, they shut down that old bastard, you know, like, so if I were him, I just would have said, like, what do I do about fatherhood? Well, first off, kid, I'm a father. Right. You know, and I coach. Like I know he, I know Larry does some coaching, like that type of Pop Warner stuff. And you know, I've written a couple books that talk about what black men can do as fathers. And I you know, I'm a impregnating role model, a bunch and I'm of women I don't know. Like right. there are a bunch of things he could have said, right. but I, I think he just viewed it as an inappropriate, unprofessional setting. And so he focused on winning the debate. Right. Right. So so David? Yeah. So what should the Republicans be doing? What do they get wrong? You're a Republican, you're on that team. You, you, you. I, so Yeah, I mean <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I always and I, we've had many conversations about this. I always felt like and I think even uh, one of the speeches I heard Bob Woodson say it, um, just being just being more competitive, just being more competitive because black liberals don't really have the monopoly on on black people. They really don't. And I feel like as time goes on, you start to see those numbers decrease and you start to see the dissatisfaction with the Democratic Party. Like, look at Joe Biden. And we spoke about this on the phone. They didn't vote for Joe Biden because they like him. They had a choice between Joe Biden and Trump and they thought they was picking the lesser of two evils. That's literally the only reason why Joe Biden is president. Literally. Right. Well, literally. Well, you say that they um, 
don't have a a, a monopoly on it. Oh, they, they kind of got a, the textbook definition of a not monopoly. Think they got one, but <laughs> now is, is it breaking up? Do we have a a political uh, Teddy Roosevelt coming to, to to bust up the monopolies? Kind, I don't know if it's a, an entity or if it's just people waking up or people having the problems and stuff. Let me get to the next thing, but I want to tell you, I don't know if you all notice, and you know, you can either say your opinion, but I think it'd be interesting to know as we speak. So there's an interesting phenomenon going in Chicago. Do you all know? I mean, I know you probably saw part of it, but it was this weird culmination. I got a call the other day. It's pretty interesting. So obviously you've seen the videos of the migrants being bust there, like in New York. And so they put them, they set up the things in, in the community, but they put them in an abandoned school and they put them in and they put them in the community, in uh, black communities in Chicago. And people were upset. I was like, we're already strapped. You should do something about it. So they're pushing back against that. And then more come, they, they confront Brandon. He doesn't do much. So now there's lawsuits, they're marching. So at the same time, this one, you might, might be lesser known. So Bruce Rauner, who was mostly feckless, but the one good thing he did well as a, as a Republican governor in Illinois, is he got a school choice initiative where the money follows the kids and they can go into uh, different parochial private schools or whatever. And when Pritzker won, he tried to get rid of it. And the, the right did a good job of doing what the left does. They bust people down to Springfield and they marched and put the kids up there with tears. I love my school. And it's, and it's held on by a string. So fast forward four years, Pritzker wins again. And now he doesn't have to worry about that. And so now they're about to shut it down. Talk to a friend of mine who, 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 Got it over the finish line. He's like, yeah, it's either going to be so watered down, it's not going to be the same thing, or it's going to be gone. It's supposed to be voting on it soon. So a friend of mine called me yesterday, yes, to say, you won't believe what happened. We went down to City Hall for a march against the buses and the migrants coming here because two of the aldermen, to their credit, is trying. they're trying to put a, a referendum on the ballot to have the citizens vote on. This is pretty slick. Instead of just repealing it because they knew it wouldn't work, to have the <laughs> citizens, we represent them, let's see what they want, vote on whether they want to be a sanctuary city or not. And half of the council don't even want to allow them to vote because they know how they'll vote. So that was the big fight. So the vote's coming up. So they went to stand in support of that vote. They look across the street. They're like, what's all the Black people doing standing over there? And they go over there. And at the very same time, there was a protest against the repeal of the voucher school program because 10,000 kids are going to get, when that gets voted out, which it probably will next Tuesday, they will have three options, which means they really have one option. The schools would have to come up with the money and give them the money so they can stay, which is a 0% option. Some fairy tale angel investor philanthropist must come along and pay the tuition for them. Or they have to go back to the crappy school that they would have been going to before after for some wow. of them three to five years of being another. So you got on one side of the street, you're protesting the mayor and the state for one thing. Other side of the state, and this is all in the black community. I don't I meant to send it to you, but I was getting attacked on Twitter. But there was a, there's a video I'll, I'll send it to you later of a woman saying we, it's time for us to stop being a you know, voting party. It's time I saw for it. us to stop voting skin color, it's time for us to start voting our, our best interest. So this is what, a 60-year-old Black woman saying, mm -hmm. enough is enough. So maybe mm. the tide is turning, but, you know, I, I think that it's going to, right, it, it's going to have to come from, and that's what I always say, you know, um, that's when we get into this madness of the Democrats and the Republicans fighting. I think it's a moot point, not saying politics doesn't matter, but it's a moot point in the sense that both sides think we're going to legislate our way out of the problem. And we're not enough people are going to have to get fed up. But the problem is it's got to get really bad before people get fed up. Because what most people will, will tell you, the average person thinking of their own best interest, don't only get fed up when it comes to them, right? It's not that they don't care. They'll see it on the news and think, man, that's messed up. And then they go about their day. But then when it's them, then they're ready to you know, draw a picket sign and run for office and do that, do all that kind of stuff. So unfortunately, it just has to be enough people. I don't know if we ever get the critical mass, but what do you think about that? Um, about that being the effect, that being the method, and you know, what, what that interesting situation in one day in Chicago. Will, that's your old hometown. What do you think about that? Do you think the people are starting to see that they have buyer's remorse for good old Brandon Johnson? You know, I mean, like you hear this all the time, like in Appalachia, people constantly say, well, I mean, it, that's just the white version of the hood, right? Like people constantly say these politicians ain't doing nothing. I mean, I still go to bars, you know, like we got to vote them all out, like, you know, to hell with the Cameron and all that. Like the the idea that the people of Appalachia, though, are going to get together and do something that would actually probably be pretty good for them 
which is electing bright blue Democrats, because there, there's not really, I mean, everyone has eight guns here. There's not really going to be a surge in crime, right. you know, like, and get some health care. Like, that's just not going to happen. And it's the same thing in inner city black communities where the big problems are crime, drugs, the Republicans would be a godsend. You know, 96% vote for the Democrats in my old ward on the upper south side of Chicago. Like, they're not going right. to, like, even Bridgeport, which is mostly, you know, Irishmen, Italians, Mexican-Americans, right. they're not going to turn out and vote Republican. I mean, so I hope it happens, but I've seen this talk from both working class whites and working class black guys my entire life, been in a lot of locker rooms, never seen it happen. I have no faith in it. I never bet that way when I go on <laughs> Dog or those kind of sites. So, I mean, I think there's a lot that could be said for that. I, I don't think it's going to occur. And I, I'll give you an opinion on why as an occasional political consultant, people to understand options need to have seen both. This, I think, is why people don't leave abusive relationships point. just on mm -hmm. some random stuff. Like you would have to, if you're a working class black guy, have seen both like functional Republicans and functional Democrats. So you could say, well, the Democrats are better on health care and the Republicans are better on crime and immigration. And right now we've got a migration problem. So I'm voting GOP. And generally, when you have poor neighborhoods with crooked politicians, that's not allowed. And this is true on both sides of the spectrum. And so the other party actually stops competing. Like we had a guest on here once, a Republican fundraiser, the guy with the raccoons. No, oh, right, right, right. <laughs> and like Benny had all these coons in the background making fun of the fact he was accused of being a black conservative you right. know, consultant. But like, I mean, he was talking about he was he proposed a very basic amount of money, like 20,000 to open a fundraising and canvassing office for the Republicans and Charles Correct Minity Point on the south side of Chicago. And they just told him no. Like it wouldn't do anything for us to get the south side of Chicago from 7% GOP to 24% GOP mm -hmm. because that's just still an ass kicking. So, I mean, it's going to be hard for people to understand something where they don't have options and where the other party doesn't even come visit you. There aren't Democrats knocking doors in Appalachian trailer parks at night. You know, right. so I, I think that's the issue. Like somebody is going to have to take that first step out of the dance floor and like grab a hand and say, OK, I want to do this. Like I'm yes. going to look a little bit first. Well, I get and the question is, is it going to be like tough Republican guys or tough urban black guys like or nothing? Well, I got two, two. You made two good points. I want to follow up with these. I, I'll give the, right. the Republican um, reply to David, but first I want to go to Chrissy yeah. about the piece that he says that it's unlikely to happen, which I agree with. But I, what only thing I say, well, kind of in the sense that the reason I say you have to get frustrated enough that it is slightly different because in the normal situation, you're dealing with whatever the normal, you're dealing with normal crime, you're dealing with, you know, that kind of stuff. You're not really dealing with buses of people being dropped off in your in your community mm -hmm. and then staying in tents. There's videos of, I think New York is bad, but in Chicago, because it's more condensed, there's like tents in front of people's houses and stuff. I mean, it's like right. in the neighborhood. Like, Not at all to jump in, but imagine being like a middle class Mexican guy. Like you're a young guy, you want a better job at carpentry. <laughs> and then you come to America and they're like, you're going to the south side of Chicago. And you pull up in the hood and you ask, where am I going to stay? Holmes, this tent. And it's just a tent <laughs> on the street in like GD country in front of someone's house. Like I would imagine that that's not that great for either party. Well, like, I've seen those situations. I mean, and where is it? Logan Square? They're just camping in the square. So mm -hmm. you've got the statue of, like, if Colonel you're not Logan. In the police you've got, like, cats and tents cooking on fires. I mean, it's funny, but it also yeah. is, that's a real problem. Like, you can't have 10,000 out-of-country, out-of-work males just living on the street. That's how wars start. You can't do that. Well, I, 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 Will and I do this sometimes, Chrissy. I'm sorry. But sorry. I, I know I'm coming to you. But he said the thing about the t tent. There is one funny thing in Chicago. So there was a family that were good. we're just going to sleep sleep in this tent because, you know, they were from Venezuela or something. You know, people are upset, but it's just cold blood. I don't know if you all saw that. So the, the family was going to stay in the tent. And then they, it was cold. It was like, I didn't realize it was so cold here, right? Because they were like, I can't stay here with my baby. It's too cold. And the dude from the, from the neighborhood was like, it's 75 in Caracas. <laughs> 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 I was like, dude, you wrong. Well, that's wrong. Well, well. I'm sorry. I, saw, Go ahead, Chrissy. I saw something where the migrants actually had signs and were protesting and were like, we need better housing Send and us better pain. <laughs> Send <laughs> us back, not to Mexico, back to Texas. They're Texas. assimilating to the local culture. <laughs> but yeah. Let me speak to Chicago because I went to Chicago when, when uh, Vivek and uh, Kathy Barnett went. So we went uh -oh. and we 
we know we organized this, you know, one day kind of um, event. And so we're in the room and I'm kind of walking around the back of the room, just kind of making sure everything is okay. And so it was an interesting event because we were able to pack the room. Of course, all of the um, establishment type people were in the front, you know, and they were the ones that were mostly asking the questions. And then the regular people were kind of in the back. So I had a chance to kind of mingle with the, the regular people or the neighbors like of that street that had came in. And they were actually hungry of the people that were there to hear what Vivek had to say and open to what he had to say. And there was only, I mean, I think there was like one FBA woman that stood up and had some smoke for him. But other than that random one person, you know, screaming reparations and, you know, really upset about it, everyone else that did kind of filter into the room seemed open and like what a, you know, Republican actually came. So I think that kind of speaks to what uh, Will said. I mean, I don't think that we can wait for the RNC to open up offices in the in the neighborhoods because they're not going to do it. But why did we have to wait for them to do anything? I mean, as exactly. Republicans, we need to be going into the inner city and, and exactly. you know, showing the people what conservatism looks like. Exactly. David, you can talk about the party. So so is Will right about the fact that they're not going to open an office and, if you know, defend them if they will? And if he is right, oh. then... And you say Christie's right about you don't have to wait for them. What do you do? Well, yeah. Well, I'm I'm gonna just address what Will say. Obviously, uh, Will is right in the fact that you know when you're when you're playing that type of political game, the numbers matter, right? So if the numbers are telling you uh, we got to spend a million dollars, and then if we do a really good job, we get twenty percent of the vote, but then that's really not other resource can go other way. Obviously. When the mathematics go, that's the route that you're going to go. So I would say just on a numbers end, he's correct. Like the average uh, party with state party would be like, nah, we can't give you fifty thousand dollars because that fifty thousand dollars could go to whatever we feel is more fruitful. But on the other end. I feel like, um, you know, our other get, you know, your other co-host is right, because at some point, and I think Will said this, somebody's going to have to take a leap out there. And I feel like it it has to be us, right? This this is what we've been preaching, right? Self-determination, self-reliance. So at some point, we can't preach self-reliance and then whine that, oh, the Republican Party didn't write me that check. And that's why I'm not over there on the south side of Chicago. So there's nothing I can do. So at some point, you have social media if you're an op-ed writer, you have the power to pen, you have this, you have that. At some point, somebody's going to have to take that long uh, uh, walk through the forest. Because like she said, people are hungry for knowledge. You look at the, Im you know, it's funny because when you strip aside politics, black people sound conservative. I'm talking about when you just strip away all the politics, look at mm -hmm. the immigration issue. They're saying, hey, we don't want them there. Now, the way if, if you watch some of those and I've watched one or two clips from, you know, the protests in Chicago and, you know, we right next door to New York. Some of these people and they in a black neighbor, they sound like Carlton Tucker. I mean, the way they going at some of these politicians, they sound like, you know, like I thought I was watching Fox News. But mm -hmm. that's how, you know, OK, now is a good time. I mean, you pointed to it. Whenever there's an issue that's unresolved and it's unlingering, now people are searching for an answer. They're searching for a different outlet. And that's where um, that's where we come in. Well, you, you got to reach out to the people. So obviously the people have to be receptive. I think many of them will be if it's done the right way. Christy says there are. But I have an example. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have an example. I, I got to give you this example. Okay. okay so. I don't agree with the language, but have you seen the in for Trump's guy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So he wears uh -huh. the shirt in for Trump, uh, but it works. He go, He's at a barbecue. He's talking to the people. He's among the people. He's having a picnic. It's going to take all different types of people to reach the community. We need some of those people who are just willing to go hang out at the park, at the barbecue. And then, oh, I'm a Republican, you know, and then just start talking politics, but just be a normal, regular person mm -hmm. at the cookout. A regular, Nick, uh, 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 yeah, regular person, <laughs> a regular person. But, it, but it, that I actually think is just like really briefly, that's a really important point. Like, that's a common critique of Black conservatives that I get from my students. 
If uh, Shamika Michelle, the lost and lovely, were here, I think, although Christy made basically the same point exactly as well. But I mean, I think she'd have some words about this, like sort of the nerdy kind of, you know, I'm proud, a proud nerd myself, but kind of the Carlton Banks stereotype guys that are often perceived as conservative black dudes. And like when I teach in an HBCU class and has 75 people in it with like their alpha and kappa gear on, or even when I play basketball and I'm still, you know, not, not terrible as I age, you know, if, if you talk about GOP politics, it's like, well, yeah, I agree that like abortion in month six is bad. I agree we shouldn't be spending all this money on these wars. My students were actually outraged looking around at Louisville and Cincinnati. We just voted a hundred billion dollar um, military aid package. I mean, to Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Taiwan. Taiwan's not at war. They probably won't, won't be for about five years. So, I mean, I, I think that there are a lot of points that can be made. But anyway, I don't think a lot of lo working class African-American audiences, which is that demographic you're really trying to reach, Black businessmen are actually already pretty flexible, are going to respond to a lot of the people that are put forward as kind of the biggest black conservative voices and faces so in practice you get a lot of events and i've been to a couple of these because i like money but you get a lot of events that are just like five black guys in suits talking to an almost entirely white audience and they're cool guys you go out to a bar with them later and place a pool get some drinks but i don't i'm not really sure that that does a lot to do outreach to the black community so again it's that question we're all getting at of how do you cross that line right um it, and yeah. is there a problem david obviously with both whether the people will be receptive. Christy said they were when she was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. and obviously, social media is different, so you get weird responses there. And then how the message is done. I mean, Christy said when she went to Chicago, she went with uh, Kathy Barnett. And I don't know if you all noticed. Of course, I know you noticed. But uh, Kathy had this uh, tweet. Was that today? Yesterday? It was about, today. Like, she must have been, I haven't talked to her yet, but I'm assuming she was frustrated. And she tweeted yeah. something, <laughs> something about Black black people being being dumb and they believe all these things but they vote a totally different way right and they're voting for people who don't really care about them and all this other stuff and a lot of people were upset by it and then i started getting a lot of you know the the fans of the, the you know the people we call like the pro-black conservative the conservative but the conscious type saying that i said that black people were also dumb because i told kathy my reply was i disagree with you they're not dumb they're emotional and they and they and they uh, approach politics in an emotional way where they and that's where the disconnect is but the problem is you can teach them you can give them facts you talked about stats will has stats but if i truly believe that abortion after a certain age as will said is bad open borders is terrible defunding the police is stupid all these things that sound like i'm a little conservative right you say black people are conservative if i believe that but i just truly believe all of the boogeyman stories i hear about republicans so i can never vote for them I just think that that's the textbook definition of it being a, an emotional response rather than a, a factual response. So one, David, is that going to make it a little bit harder? You still got to try, you got to chip away at it, but is that going to make it a little bit harder to make the inroads? And especially when you have people like that that took my response to Kathy's post as saying, I got responses like, so which type of Black person are you? Do you have different genes? Because are you not one of the dumb ones? Well, the first two words of my tweet was I and disagree. So I don't think any of them are dumb. So what are you talking about? But they're not thinking because they're, they're being emotional, right? It's like, oh, so you're, you know, the typical, you know, you, you're doing this speaking out for whites and all that kind of thing. So how is that dynamic going to play out um, when you do the outreach? Um, I, I mean, I definitely think it's going to have an impact because, you know, I think we spoke about this on the phone. I think Democrats have done a great job of wielding that racism tool, that identity positive, I feel like they have used it so great. I think to uh, me and you was talking and you still have black people to this day. You ask them, uh, what's the number one impediment to uh, the black community? Oh, that's easy. White supremacy and racism. And I'm just like, well, if you look at the data, the number one predictor of social mobility, me and you talked about this, is class. It's not even race anymore. So you look at a guy like, I don't know. I use Obama. I use uh, what's the other guy? Um, uh, Bob Johnson. Magic Johnson's a billionaire now. You don't think they could walk in any room and get what they want? They're past the glass ceiling. And yeah, they're you could argue they're a small example. They're not the majority of black people. But the point is, is that you still, when you engage in dialoguing with people, you still have people that are steeped in looking through 
the world through the lens of race. And as we get far removed from slavery, far removed from the black codes, far removed from Jim Crow and segregation, the number one predictor of your success is your family structure and your social mobility status. Look, look, you look at um, um, what they call the, the Martha Vineyard Blacks. All mm-hmm. of their kids, where do they go? HBCU, Ivy League. It's no coincidence. They have the resources and they have, they're stable and they're functional. They can do it. They go to Howard. They go to Spelman. This, this is not right. some- Or oh, anywhere else they want to go. <laughs> right. But the, but the thing is, they'll frame it like, oh yeah, you're talking about a few Blacks and they got lucky. They didn't get lucky. They didn't get- they didn't get you. Do you are you really surprised that mm-hmm. Obama's kids go to an Ivy League school? Are you really surprised by that? Right, and it's like when we talk about get rid of legacy. You also get, people. I, I joked about that when we were doing the Supreme Court decision. I was like, you do know black families have legacy too, not a lot at Ivy, but some. But all of the HBC, I mean, I know there were plenty of families that everybody went to the same college. How, I mean, what do you think they're doing? But Christy, isn't part of the problem that? The so one people use bad examples, so they'll say Obama and all that. I kind of like the Tim Scott Sunny um uh debate on um the view because she kept saying exceptional, exceptional, right? Which is silly at some point you run out because he's using billionaires, but we overlook you know the the percentage. What is it like? I don't care, it's seven or eight percent, seem like a low percentage, but of 40 million people, there's millions of blacks that are in you know the top three to five percent. So one, we should use them as examples, your engineers, your doctors, your lawyers, your business owners. But the problem is kind of like the gaslighting that's going on. You talk about that when you talk about feminism and what they're saying on women. But here's another way, in the sense that if you talk to those people that I'm talking about, you talk to a black doctor, if he's been, if he's an emotional black, I'm already going over the hill, getting in trouble, I might go all the way. I've talked to them. They're like, I went to Wharton or I went to Harvard Business School, you know, and I make a million dollars. And then they'll, but but David, they will also talk about racism. And then you say, okay, what was the last time you experienced it? And they won't come up with one. So then they'll flip it back. They're like, you know, I don't really remember. But they'll say, but, you know, still, I know I'm thinking about the other brothers and sisters. Everybody couldn't have gone to Harvard and be, you know, successful like right. you know, all the others. But I was like, name one of the people in your family. Like, you give me a cousin or somebody. Well, I don't know, like, because of course this circle now is small and the circle is other doctors. So they just, they listen to the root and they listen to the stories and the movies and the TV show and the power, right? They was like, well, you know, they'll paint a scenario and they'll describe it. It's really dark. You're like, dude, that's a scene from The Wire. Hey, what I dude. actually find is that a lot of black professionals, and you're now seeing the same obnoxious version of this from like white alt writers and like upper class Indian women and so on. But what they'll actually do is claim racism all the time, but just describe really small incidents. Oh, that. That's like my white thing. boyfriend said he loved my dark skin. Like that kind of stuff. And they'll ignore like the benefits of social class. Like, you know, sometimes when I drive my Mercedes to the free car park that comes with being a family practice doctor, I'll be asked by the $9 an hour Appalachian staffer whether I belong there. It's like that type of shit. Right. But it, there's total ignoring of the when I, I drive my Mercedes to my hospital's free parking. So right. it's you know, a lot, a lot of dudes riding bikes out there after that third DUI. Like there, there are levels to this. Like I've actually right, been more, and I think most of you guys have. And so. that's true. That's true, Chrissy. So you get that, and, and that's true too. But I was addressing the weirder part that I can't expect. They'll say, "Well, it's everywhere." You know, you know. Well, you know, we had Heather McDonald, on, and somebody challenged. I don't know if you saw it. She went to Berkeley, and some black law student at Berkeley approached her. "You're a racist. Your book is racist. I deal. You don't understand what I deal with. I deal with racism every day." And they were like, well, what do you deal with? And she was like, Black Panther came in the room. No, it's like, what racism do you deal with? And I said, Heather, did he ever give you a list? It's like, nope. So he just said it every day. They just say it. Right. So that's Wakanda. true. But on the other side, right, don't they also just say, well, I hear that it's really hard for Blacks. Joe well, Biden said that it's really bad. Well, his, his Secretary of State said that the number one direct domestic terrorist is white supremacy, so it must be really bad. Is it bad for you? No. Nope. Spouse? No. Nope. Cousin? No. Nope. Friends? No. Nope. Coworkers? No. Nope. So who's it bad for? I don't know. Blacks. So don't have you experienced that? It blows me away when they say that. Do you know any blacks that have done that? That's like upper middle class, but they talk about it's really hard, but it's not hard for them, but it's hard for the others. Right out here for. I, th- <laughs> I think what happens, it, and I'll give you an example. Um, I was told by one of our, you know, really popular. Um, conservative friends who I'm not going to name because I always, (laughs) I always throw out that 
when I walk out my door, I don't experience racism. I can't remember the last time that I've experienced racism. And I was told to stop saying that because it's by a black conservative because it's dangerous, right? I already know what you're talking about. To kind of put that out there. (laughs) And don't say. (laughs) And because I kind of tuned out after that point, I can't really give you the justification as to as to what was said. Because I didn't hear the rest. (laughs) I didn't hear the rest. (laughs) It was so stupid. I turned up turned off my hearing aid. Yeah, I just kind of, you know. Yeah, go ahead. Minimizing the lived experiences of all those people that are now going to interact with police like they're not going to kill them. I've heard this too. Like yeah, uh, I can't. The last time I experienced real racism, like I'm going to kill you, you coon kind of stuff or like the equivalent of being called white boy because I'm biracial was literally like for both those terms, like high school scuffles. Right. Like I can't imagine someone in business life doing that. And I don't think anyone can. So that's why the, that's why the fantasy world is so important. Like, no, he didn't say anything. but He scowled at me and I knew what he was thinking. Right. You know, all he right. takes is black girls. Is he a fetishist? It's this desire to like mind read because no one's an open asshole in any group above yeah. a certain level. Right. But isn't that the conversation, Will, we had with the with the anti-racist we had on lovely women, but they were like microaggressions are so important. And of course, it affects your health, which I agree with if you allow it to, if you take it so seriously. Say, well, isn't the solution to to not assume that every time someone says something to you is because you're black? Whatever? They were like, no, this is real. It's really bad. It's like, there's a problem with them if they're racist, but there's a bigger problem with you if you let it stop your life because it's they, because the parking space at Walgreens was too far away. I, I liked right. both those people, but I mean, my assumption with them, quite honestly, was that a mental health issue for like <laughs> upper class women might be constantly being afraid. Like a lot of the stuff they were describing, like, you know, will a white guy be this type of person? Will a black like? Thinking constantly that every white guy's a pervert, every black guy's a criminal, everyone who touches your head has some weird interest in black hair, like everyone who glares at you is a racist. That's got to be really fucking tiring. But, but, but we'll be nice. It's not we were real. Nice like them. a lot of people are jackasses. Very few people are KKK or Nation right. of Islam level racists. Yeah, I'm but you leave that there. Like nobody cares about you. Their magazines are driving too slow. You're being nice though, because the examples they gave were even worse. One of the examples, people go back and go and check out the episode. Uh, I think it was a week ago, two weeks ago. There was a a a, a scenario where the, the black woman was with her friend, who's white, and her daughter at a restaurant. She's having a conversation with, not like they're standing there like strangers, having a conversation with them. This is the racism she deals with, which proves that the country's better off than it was. And the hostess came up. And looked at them, her, the black woman, the two white women, and looked at them and said, two for dinner? Dramatic pause so you can catch that. That was the racism. Racism in America is so bad that we went from lynching people and owning them as property to asking them, assuming that they're not with their friends when they go to dinner. It made the book. (laughs) She wrote it in the book, so it still stuck with her. Can't believe she didn't think we were together. We were talking. That's... I don't. I, I was. Thinking. I actually once lost a friend over something like that when I worked in the nightlife business. Not to like over talk, but like I went to one of the clubs that like Meg Group and I were managing myself and my buddy Ozzy Trejo, and there was this girl that we used to party with who's like a white urban girl, like alternative green hair, like kind of raver or punk style, and like she's in line. We we're gonna let her in, and behind her there's a group of like black hood looking dudes, and there were we we knew some of them, like we were cool with them. There was no hostility. But we like let her in and we're like just one VIP. And she freaked out. It was like, why aren't my friends here? And it was like, oh, like those other people that you weren't talking to were like close friends of yours. So we ended up like letting them in. We we're cool with the guys. But her assumption was that like racism on the part of this all minority group of like graduate students was what had blocked this. Like we just didn't like black people or something like that. I'm not sure how it mm-hmm. figured. Two of the guys there with us were black. But it's just the idea that anything that happened, maybe we were self-hating black people. Right, this is a very right. true story. I'm not telling you especially well, but it's this idea that right. anything that happens, you don't assume that the green haired white woman and the six two black small forward are dating. That's because you're a bigot. Right. It's not just practical assumptions made about how people behave or anything like that. You hate blacks or these days, sometimes whites or something like that. And no, that's almost never true. Christy, what were you going to say? I, yeah, I have to say this because I don't enjoy <laughs> hate mail. So I got to get this out. <laughs> it's not it's not that they're all wrong it's not that life is not hard for certain people it's not that you know there aren't certain people that you know class that are stuck in the system or stuck at the lower ends of the system we i recognize that but how much of that is because 
but racism, but because the man is holding us back. And how much of that is because of family dynamics, lack of fathers in the home, mm -hmm. um, things that are within our control, at, either as a community or individually. Right. So I don't want yeah. to say like, okay, no, there's not a problem, period, because we know it is. Like we can David, I'm going to give you a, a word, but I got to say something to Chris. I got to push back against my buddy Chris here. Because everything you just said makes sense. I would even say that some of that, more of that may be racist than we may, than we may think it is. But that's missing the point because I wasn't talking about them. You're like those people attacking me because of Kathy's tweet. I didn't, I wasn't talking about the poor. I was talking about the upper middle class people who are trying to act as if they know what that's like because they want to feign all this racism that they're dealing with. So they're not dealing with it, but it must be hard out there for someone. Well, duh. Common sense. You see homeless people. You see people struggling. Obviously, it's hard, hard out there for some people. But you you don't know these people. You this Twitter co conversation pissed you off, didn't it, bro? You're co opting. <laughs> you're co opting their 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 hate and their anger and their racism and what their, their struggles to make yourself feel better. So you can like I'm down for the cause. You're not dealing. Those people aren't dealing with anything, Chrissy. So you're right. right about those people. But the people that I'm talking to aren't dealing with any of that. They're dealing with being sat at the restaurant and getting into, into Will's club. That actually, I think Christy made the best point there, but very, very quickly, you just made a good one, which is the idea of co-opting racism. So like, if nothing happens to you, you're kind of claiming the sufferings of like your more struggling, like ne'er-do-well cousin. And this is very important. Like when you see like some of the richest people in the world, like Sayira Rao, like forward cast Indian American woman who's written two best-selling books, not that I'm counting them one ahead, but I mean, just like on Twitter, 80,000 followers talking all this shit, like in this racist, classist, white supremacist country, like obviously you're a member of the upper elite. What right. you get paid five thousand dollars to go to dinner with people. That's your hustle. And so your stories involve entirely other people. And your right. victimization comes from attaching yourself to a group that contains a disproportionate number of poor people. And this actually brings up a really dark question. Do you want those people to get richer? And, and I'm sorry, David, I, I'm well, coming to you. But I gotta say this last thing to what Will said. What Will said was perfect. I just want to add the little cherry to it. Not only right. Does, is, are these people co-opting other people's struggles? But let's be real, for the very vast majority of them, not all, but the vast majority of them, if they have a cousin that fits in there, they're co-opting <laughs> his struggle so they can say, man, I got a cousin that's struggling. He's doing things. But if that cousin come around and be like, nigga, get away from me. Right. Don't come in my house. They would never invite that cousin to the house. They would never hang out. With, they go to uh, the family and say, oh, God, he's here. Right? But then they use them to say, I know that struggle because I experienced it, but they wouldn't be caught dead with that cousin. David, save the Republican Party, last word. <laughs> yeah, um, just, <laughs> just, just, just to piggyback off what you said, I do believe that within culture, especially in my opinion, in Black culture, there's something called collective... <clears throat> I'm sorry. No, I just oh, had something in my throat. Go on. Oh, you don't believe in black culture? No, okay, I, okay. We, we had a two-hour debate about black culture. That's another episode. But go on. Okay, so what I'm saying is, especially in a black and community... And I did not say I didn't believe it. That's not true. You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> no, but I, I said you didn't I, know what it was, and all the people on the roof don't know what it is, and all those people talking about it on Twitter don't know what it is. But go on. Carry on. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out next episode. But look, um... I do believe in a black community, you do have this collective politics, right? Mm -hmm. So every member of every social group wants to feel some sense of belonging, right? And if the main lens is racism and, and everybody's talking mm -hmm. like, oh, I've been through this, I've been through that. And then you're scanning your mind like, damn, I, I want to be a part of it. What do I do? What do I do? Okay. Yeah, I, I remember this time when I walked in the bagel shop and they took the white guy's order instead of mine. So now you see that it's white supremacy going on. So then you, it's, 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 it's the reason why people use data instead of antidote evidence, right? Because you have this element where I want to be a part of the group, even if it's not happening to me personally, how can I kind of, tailor my experiences to what I feel like the dominant group is um is, is is saying. And just to point this out, I read an article by Will. I, I thought it was an amazing article. I should have said That's that. I don't know Will, go ahead. No, no, I'm not saying it because he's here. No, 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 seriously. 
He did an article where he was basically rooting out the Karen shit. I forgot. He right, right, going, right. Barbecue you know Becky about? and the girl at the Yale. Yeah, it, it's called the Karens were mostly yeah. right. I looked at all those cases where like middle class white or sometimes upper middle class black women were accused of like just calling the police on men, harassing black men. And almost all the women were like, no, nah, I thought this guy was a rapist. Like the Central Park yeah. dog walker was like a dude that came out of the ramble in Central Park, which is, as I understand, right. known for like gay and straight sex, or at least was, by the way. But like tried to lure her dog away from her dog treats. Treat. Yeah, just acting crazy for like 10 minutes consistently. And she called 12 on him finally. But yeah, sorry to interrupt, Dave, but they were all uh, they were all like, that. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. No, I, I, I really I really thought I was like, wow, I'm like, that's. Cause you kind of opened my eyes. I was like, wow, I, you kind of dug deep. And I'm like, wow, you look behind the scenes. But when you look at the front of the case, they kind of create this narrative like, oh yeah, here go another Karen. Even when you look at the root, cause sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll scroll through the social media and a lot of these black magazines, they'll have a whole section dedicated towards Karens. And, and you look and you go, this is not even newsworthy, but it's just more like, oh, like for example, I give you a perfect example. The speaker, the new speaker of the house, his name is Mike, Mike Johnson. Johnson. Am I correct? Mike Johnson. Who? Black man. When he, okay. Mike Johnson, right? Mike Johnson, Who? I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. It's a, it's a throwback joke. Right. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, We're silly. he okay. got elected and he stood at the podium and he gave his speech. Oh, you know, they don't want a guy who's pro-family, pro this. And there was a black, so, uh, a black reporter there and she kind of chimed in and it was an old white lady next to her. She was like, oh, shut up. They did a whole article calling her a Karen. She's racist. And the basis of her being racist, she said, shut up to a black person. There was no, there was no like, okay, she got caught saying the N word. She actually stopped discriminating against black. Like they did need to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Th that, Maybe that she was right. <laughs> yeah, but but that was that was their whole thing. She's a racist. Why? Right. She says shut up to a, a a black person. Like, and and I I feel like I would have feel better if she would have blocked somebody from getting a job. At least you could claim okay, there's some sort of discrimination there. But right, telling somebody shut. Up. And even um, it's funny that you mentioned about the college and stuff. I did an article for um the American Spectator because um I found it interesting right around the time with a. Supreme Court had uh, shut down the whole affirmative action thing. And you, you know, you turn uh, 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 Joyce Reed and all these people were mad. Oh, they, they killed affirmative action. We're going back 100 years. And I'm just like, well, now that affirmative action is dead, maybe you can finally find the real disadvantaged people. Because, you know, when I've everything that I've watched and I've learned about this whole affirmative action thing, most of the black people that get in and we spoke about this. Is the Bill Cosby? Yeah, Obama's kids. Like, like it's not, you're right. It's, it, it, so it's it's not even like oh we we were helping disadvantaged people until white supremacy came along and knocked it down. I feel like now that affirmative action's out the way, you can actually put energy into finding qualified because because like um like Kelly said, there's real disadvantaged people out there, and we don't want to ignore them, especially as black conservatives. So my whole thing with this college thing, and it ties into this whole racist thing, maybe now we can start looking for disadvantaged people. Because one one of the issues of being poor is that not only do you not have, they always talk about money, and I don't even think money is the biggest thing. It's also a lack of information. Right. Because if you don't even know that the U.S. Naval Academy has this great program for your son, and you can get him out of the hood, if you don't even, if you... You can't even claim racism and say, oh, that person didn't get the job because it's racist. If they were poor and they need and they never even had knowledge that these institutions existed. How would the institution even get a chance to weigh whether they have merit or they don't have merit to get right. it? Because well, they we're don't. Gonna, we're going long. We have to leave it there. Will is packing up. Uh, no, I just took the computer. Chrissy has like to get five. on her flight to come back to the States from uh, India. <laughs> but, you know, it's been great talking with you. We have to have a part two you, so you can talk about solutions that the Republican pro Party can get if they can break through the, the wall of silence where it's not allowed to speak. And then we can talk about that black culture if you want to. But, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. We definitely going to talk about that. He is uh, David Cipher, a bit writer, black conservative Republican. And um, it's been great having you on, David. Thanks for joining us. 
Thank you, thank you. you country to say god bless the us of a land of the free and a home of the brave god get all of the praise i got a country to say because i'm patriot j and i'm saving a day